Pinchas. Pinchas. Um, as I said, we're going to start in chapter 25, verse 1. Because obviously the, the folks that decided on where to divide the Torah portions obviously watched a lot of Dukes of Hazard. Because, <clears throat> you know, at the end when they're, or like in between a commercial when they're jumping, you know, like, Ugh! and then you have to either wait a whole commercial or sometimes a whole week to find out if they make it or not, right? These cliffhangers. And so, obviously... They get that from American television. But the, last week was a cliffhanger because you dropped in right, at, or you're, you're, drop, you're taken out right as uh, uh, Pinchas has this, this point of zealousness. So um, we are going to start again in chapter 25, verse 1. And I um, have been meaning to do this as we read the Torah portions. Blessed be Hashem, the blessed one. Blessed is Hashem, the blessed one for all eternity. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, giver of the Torah. Amen. Uh, so, chapter 25, verse 1. Uh, Israel settled in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. They invited the people to the feasts of their gods. The people ate and prostrated themselves to their gods. Now, I don't remember how much we talked about this last week, and I didn't, I didn't re-listen to last week's teaching because I can't hear the sound, I can't stand the sound of my own voice. Um, did we talk about this last week? Do y'all remember? Good, y'all don't remember either. Great. That's fantastic. That helps me a bunch. Do you remember? No, you weren't paying attention either. All right. Good. See, it's good that y'all don't pay really close attention because then I can teach two things the same in two weeks and then you don't remember. Everybody online is like, no, you did, you did, whatever. Okay, so Israel settles in Shittim and the people commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab, right, which remember Moab is a cousin, distant cousin, right? And I just find verse 2 so incredibly deep and complex and illuminating, I guess, they invited the people to the feast of their gods. To the what? To the feasts. How do they introduce Israel to idolatry and those kinds of things? Through the feasts. So here in Israel's history, idolatry is introduced through feast days of a, for a pagan god who we'll later find out as uh, Baal Peor. And I got a couple things to talk about him. They come through the feast. So in order to repent and to turn away from idolatry, we do that by joining ourselves to Hashem's feasts. Right? Yeah. We, Israel is constantly connecting themselves to, you know, they're constantly struggling with this idolatry thing and, and they constantly have the, this deal. But here it really explicitly says through the feast. And I think that's really fascinating um, because we, because the feast days in any ancient religion and even in modern religion, um, you think about one of the ones we know most besides Christianity is, is, uh, is Muslim, right? It's Islam. You have Ramadan for a month. You have the other feast days. And those people that engage those feast days and are, are religiously observant, it becomes the cycle of life, right? Everything is, everything is kind of marked around those days. Um, and again, we can, we can recall it, and we have some understanding about, you know, Christmas. You have fond memories of Christmas. Everything in your life Probably even today, no matter how long you've been keeping Torah, probably for most of us, our year is still kind of focused around Christmas, even though we don't celebrate Christmas, but like it's just ingrained in us, like that's what we, that's the season of the year we look forward to, especially here in Louisiana when it's 175 degrees, you know, we look forward to some kind of, some kind of, uh, so we just, this is the way we think, and life is kind of measured in those ways. When the same way, every, every religion has a calendar, 
a sacred calendar. And those calendars, if you connect to them, again, we're talking about what we're talking about, Rosh Kodesh, they become the heartbeat of your life. And you start to mark time. And not only time, it's, it's not so important that we mark time. It's that when we begin to mark time, we also mark memories. And we are much more attached to our memories than we are to time. We, when we start to get a sense of marking sacred time, Shabbat, Rosh Kodesh, the Moedim, the fast, all the different things that, where God is connecting with his people, then we start to correlate memories with that sacred time, right? Your, your baby gets their first haircut. Oh, we fasted the day before that because it was, it was the ninth of Av or, or whatever. You know, you start, you start to connect those things. Then it becomes more than just a sacred calendar. It becomes your calendar. And it becomes your time. And all of a sudden, the Father's heartbeat, which the calendar is, is God's heartbeat in time. The Father's time then and your time start to interweave. And you draw closer to him in ways you didn't even think were possible. And it's a really beautiful thing. So they, the Israel comes to idolatry and harlotry, it says, through, to the feasts of their gods. And then look at the second part of the verse. It says they did two things, right? They did what? What's one number one they did? They ate. We'll come back to that one. And number two, they bowed down or prostrated themselves to their gods. So why this is so interesting to me, I think, is that we read this, and I think a lot of people would read this and not even see eight. They wouldn't even recognize that. The only word I think they would really notice would be bowed down or prostrated, right? Because we know, obviously, right? It is completely obvious that bowing down, prostrating yourself to a different God is a bad thing, right? That's a big no-no and everybody, it's unheard of, it's unspeakable. To the, to the, the point that um, if you ever traveled, like I was going to say if you ever traveled like to the, to the Orient, but heck, if you even go into a Chinese buffet, right, and there's what all over the place? Buddha statues, right? Would you ever bow down to a Buddha statue? Like when you walk in the door, oh, like, oh, peace be with you. Whatever. I don't know what you say in Buddhism, but um, <laughs> I'm thinking of the, never mind. Um, but you would never bow down to a Buddhist. In, it, in our sensibilities, it's just not something you would ever do, right? You obviously know that is absolutely a no-no. It's just unspeakable. You would not do it. It's an outright sign of betrayal to God. And it, it just, it's horrifying to even think people would do that. That you would see Christian friends and believing friends and family that you know, um, you know, go somewhere and bow down to a, a stat. It's just unheard of, unspeakable. But that's not the only thing they did to attach themselves to the foreign gods. Again, one is really blatant, and one, if you were not reading carefully, you wouldn't have even seen. Does that make sense? What's the first thing it said that they did? They ate. And not to get on, like, my Randy soapbox about how eating is worship, because Joe, Joe Good does it better than I do. But this verse shows us that Eating is equal to prostrating. Or if not equal, it all is in the same, it's in the same family, right, of, of action and how we treat that. And I just, this week while I was reading this, I was so struck by the fact that 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I would have never seen eight. Because all I was trained to see, all my, in my mind, the ultimate slap in God's face is bowing down before a different God. Because God doesn't care how you eat, right? He, it doesn't matter. The eating's not important. That's just something in the old law or what, all the stupid stuff we, we say. But we didn't understand eating as worship. And what were they eating? What do you think they were eating? Yeah, the offerings of the pagan gods. They were eating in their temples 
and in their sacred spaces. Now, let me just kind of bring this home really quick. If you're married and your spouse cooks, there is a good chance, especially in the South, but I know at other places in the country, don't email me, um, where if someone loves to cook and enjoys cooking, that is their gift. That is their, it's, it's like an offering. I mean, you know, one of the hard things about like having Hanok and having, you know, people that eat differently than we do is that when, we, when Hanok comes in, Everybody wants to cook for him, right? <laughs> and I know from just from him telling me stories, that's not just here. That's everywhere he goes, which is a beautiful, hospitable, and it's appreciated. He appreciates that fact. But he doesn't eat like we do. He, he can't eat like we do. And so it can feel to us like a lack of appreciation. It can feel to us almost like a slap in the face, right, when he won't eat because it, we're so emotionally and, and spiritually tied to giving someone food and providing someone food. And so if, you're in a, if your spouse cooks and they enjoy cooking, there's something very, if you're not the cook and you don't have that gift, you might not understand how important it is for, for you to eat their food in your home. That, that's a sacred space. That's a and that's a sacred time. That's an important time, an important thing, that they're the one providing nourishment, that they're the one providing it, food provides connection and all those things. So for you, as the non-cooking spouse or the whatever, to go and go, call home and go, I'm not coming home to eat. I'm going to eat with so-and-so of the same, like if you're the husband, and go like, hey, honey, I'm not going to make it home. Uh, Susie so-and-so or whatever invited, and I'm, she's cooking for me, and I'm going to eat at her house. <laughs> oh, oh, you are, really? Yeah, sure you are. Yeah, all of us, the, the tension in the room was just like, it went to 11. Right. <laughs> but it's just eating. It's just food. God doesn't care, right? So ladies, why should you care where your husband eats? Okay, I know Heather's back there like, who? she's, do you understand, right? Do you understand? All the women here fanning, like, okay. None of your men are eating anywhere else. I'm just using this as an example, I promise you. Okay, so if it's not, if it's that big of a deal to us, right, how can it not be a massive deal to our creator and father and redeemer who told us, if you're going to be with me, if you're going to be married to me, this is when we eat, and this is what we eat, and this is how we eat, right? It's, it's, a mar it's, a, it's in the ketubah. It's in the marriage contract. It's, it's in the covenant. And when you go off and you eat at other gods' houses, because that's basically what it is, Hashem gets highly offended, right? And he doesn't just do this, right? It doesn't stop here. Right, it, and and I feel like the wrath of a woman and the wrath of Hashem is probably pretty close to the same. So we uh, we should, uh, again, we have spent too many too long separating um, separating the supernatural from the natural, right? And going well, like God acts like this, but we act like this. Or, or, or we, we think of things this way, but God thinks of them this way. No, like there's a pretty good one-to-one -one for most things. If you would be offended at something, then know that Hashem probably is offended at something. If something brings you joy, know that it's probably, it bring, probably brings him joy as well as far as it goes relationships and things like that. So I, I just, again, I think like this verse is so packed full of stuff for us. Um, so verse 3 says, Israel became attached to Baal Peor. All right? So you have Baal Peor, which means basically like the master Peor or the Lord Peor. The, the Bible is actually calling another God master or Lord. <laughs> I'm not doing it. The Bible's doing it, which is kind of weird in itself. But um, Israel is in Shittim. They're in the land of Moab. There is a mountain there called Peor. That's the name of the mountain. Now, what's the name of their God? Baal Peor. 
What's the name of the mountain? Peor. Because you don't have a God of the valley. Those don't exist. You don't have a God of the low spots. You don't have like the mud hole God, right? Your gods live where? On mountains, right? And that's where you worship them. And your gods many times are, and the name of the mountain where you worship them are named the same thing, right? So I just draw that out. It's very simple, but I just draw that out to show you the continuity and culture that we're talking about. Moshe met Hashem on a mountain called what? Sinai, right? Sinai. These, mid, these Moabites have this god, Peor, Baal Peor, that lives on the top of Mount Peor, right? Uh, let's continue. Uh, they, so they attached themselves to Baal Peor, and the wrath of Hashem flared against Israel. And Hashem said to Moses, take the leaders of the people, hang them before Hashem against the sun or in the daytime, and the flaring wrath of Hashem will withdraw from Israel. So this is all important for where we're going in the, in, in the Parsha Pinchas. So the idea to hang them um, really could be translated impale is kind of the way that most notes, commentary talks about it. That they were to be impaled, right? Which is, I, I kind of think hanging would be hu- more humane than being impaled, but maybe not. I don't, n- neither one of them sounds good. Um, and so verse 5, it says, So Moshe said to the judges of Israel, to the who? Judges of Israel. So you have this, un- what I want you to kind of see in these next few verses is the, the, sh- the strati, or the strata, I don't know what the, Stratuses, I don't know what the plural of strat, uh, structure is a good word, of, of Israelite community here in, the, in the, the, the wilderness, right? So he says to the judges of Israel, let each man kill his men who were attached to Baal Peor. So these judges, who are these judges? Well, you got like, you got captains over thousands and hundreds and fifties, right? And then you've got the 70 elders and then you've got the priest. You've got several layers of jurisdiction that you have here for a uh, kind of a self-governing nation, a society. Um, and it says in verse 6, Behold, a man of the children of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman. Now, some of your translations might say princess or something different like that. Near to his brothers in the sight of Moshe and in the sight of the entire assembly of the children of Israel. And the people were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Okay, so why were the people weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting? Why? Yeah, well, it's the month of Tammuz, right? So there's a lot of weeping in Tammuz. (coughs) By the way... That in the prophets where it says that they were weeping for Tammuz, right? It could be, we, we understand it as like they were weeping for the god Tammuz. But another way to read that is they were weeping for the month of Tammuz because that's what you do. Okay, so back to this. The, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. It'll, it'll, land, it'll land later. So they were weeping because of the nation's degradation. And because there was already a plague started. When, they, when the Israelites began this harlotry, the plague began. Right? We don't hear about it until a couple verses later. So maybe in our minds we don't think it started until like when it said. But the plague had already started taking lives. And here's what I think is the, the big deal about this Israelite, which we later find out his name is Zimri. He's a Simeonite leader, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it's bad enough that he is engaging as an Israelite prince. He is engaging with another nation. Because remember, leadership has that elevated, elevated responsibility. It's bad enough that he's doing it in the first place. He could have been doing that over there, right? If you're going to worship their God, go and do it over there. Leave it outside of the camp of Israel. So it's bad enough that he's doing it first. The second that he's actually bringing it into the camp. Right? Now, we talked about, you, remember, you know, our concentric circles of Kedusha. Why is bringing this into the camp so important? Why is it such a negative thing? Because who lives in, who's the main important person that lives in the camp? Hashem does. 
right? Hashem does. Why is it whenever an Israelite is unclean, they have to go outside of the camp? Because Hashem lives there. Not because the person is icky or bad or sinful, but because Hashem lives there. And just like when your little nasty, ruddy, rodent children, our, I should say, run in and they're all muddy and their feet are all nasty and everything, do you, you don't kick them out because they got dirty. You, kick, you make them clean up because you don't want the rest of the house dirty, right? Same thing. It's not that God has anything against somebody who's unclean. It's just, it's just you got to keep the clean house because of who lives there, right? So he brings this desecration into the camp, and the camp is a sacred space, right? Not only that, so he's doing it. He's doing it in the camp, and he comes, and he, it's this flaunting that before Moses and before the sight of the entire people, absolute outright rebellion and not only the rebellion i i think rebellion can be dealt with but what can't be dealt with is a deadened conscience or a a warped conscience where you people who rebel and they know they're rebelling and it's kind of like a oh how far can i you can usually you can deal with those people but someone whose rebellion has just turned into the way they are, you, you know what I'm saying? You, know, you understand the difference? You, re, some rebellion is just testing the boundaries. Like they know they shouldn't be, but they will anyway. And some rebellion just becomes the way people live. That's just who they are, and their conscience is seared at that point. And so the rebellion is flaunted, and, and it's almost like I dare you to say something, right? Right? I dare you to correct me. I dare you to critique me. And it's that attitude that I think we really find in, in Zimri. And it says, um, they were weeping at the tent of meeting, and that's because of the plague. They were weeping before Hashem. Verse 7, Phineas or uh, Pinchas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the Cohen, <coughs> saw. And he stood up from amid the assembly and took a spear in his hand. And he followed the Israelite man into the tent and pierced them both, the Israelite man and the woman, into her stomach. He pierced them both through the, the no-no area. <laughs> that, if you need to make this story come alive anymore, you're welcome. Because that's literally the, that's, <clears throat> that's what's going on. And he pierced them both, and the plague was halted from among the children. See, the plague was already going on. How long? Obviously, since they began this harlotry. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Okay? So, huge number. Phineas stops the plague. Now, there are some people that have a problem with Phineas's zealousness. It almost seems like vigilante justice like how can this guy get away with just well okay first of all who was this guy he's the son of the high priest at that time and some commentary some jewish commentary even alludes to maybe he may have even been the high priest he may have already taken the mantle because remember in the last few chapters of numbers we span like 38 years right a lot happened aaron dies Eleazar takes over so Pinchas was, if not already the high priest, was the next in line, okay? Which does what? It puts him at a different level of Kedusha than anybody else in the camp, right? So he's not just some guy. He's the Kohen Gadol in training, in waiting, in line. Now, if he's the next in line or if he is the Kohen Gadol at the moment, either way, this is a pretty radical step to just spear, just kebab two people, right? It's a pretty radical thing. But it's a radical sin. It's a radical offense against Hashem and against the rest of the people. And so we, we go on and read. It says that um, 
in, the, in verse 10, it says, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Pinchas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the Kohen, turned back my wrath from the children of Israel when he zealously avenged my vengeance among them. So I did not consume the children of Israel in my vengeance. Now, that part that talks about my vengeance, does anybody have that? Does it say it any differently in your translation? Or seemingly different? Jealousy? Okay. What other words do you have? Zealous anger. Zealous anger. Okay. I, I, I heard this in a lecture I was listening to on this. Um, translated as, it's basically, um, Pincus was zealous for my name. Which, to me, kind of changes the way you read this a little bit. In other words, the way it's read here and in most of our translations, it's this idea of like God is up there watching what's going on on his throne and he's just brewing. Like he's just, his neck's red. He's kind of doing what you ladies were doing here a while ago. Like his neck's starting to get red, right? He's, he's flushed. He's get, like, he's just waiting to explode. And before he does, this Phineas guy pops up and, and, and impales these people. And so God doesn't have to. He executed, Phineas executed God's vengeance, God's judgment, so God didn't have to. That's the way this reads. However, if we read it that, um, that he did not consume the children of Israel in his vengeance, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, uh, when he zealously avenged my name or my reputation among them, when we read it like that and have that idea, we understand that a little bit differently that Phineas was not being like puppeted by God to go kill two people. Phineas realized that what was going on, the height of this thing with Zimri, with Zimri and Cosby, the height of this thing is an affront to Hashem's name, right? It's an affront to the very reputation of our God. What are people going to think about our God if they see this circus going on? And that's what's important. That's what's important. So some people have a problem with, with Phineas because it seems like it was just vigilante justice. Well, first of all, it wasn't just some guy. This is either the Kohen Gadol or the Kohen Gadol in training. And we know that the Kohen Gadol, his, he is the God's representative to the people, and he's the people's representative to God. He works, he works in both realms, which has got to be stressful. Right? He works in both realms. At this height of this rebellion and harlotry and sin, there is only one person. There is only one sphere of Kedusha that can handle that. Because of who Phineas is and because of the priesthood he represents, because of who his father and his grandfather are, he alone is the one to exact this justice. God had told Moshe before, Gather up the judges. Well, Pincus is one of those because of who he is. And it's, he said to hang these before the sun, right, in the daytime or impale them. That's exactly what he does. So he's actually following the prescription of Moses as told by Hashem. It's not vigilante in any way, shape, or form because of who he is and because of how he does it. Now, on the other side... Pincus is kind of the father of the zealots. Do you guys remember when we talked about the zealots in the silent years, right? They all kind of, Pincus is one of their heroes, obviously, right? Because whenever things are going awry, if you just kill the people that are making it go awry, things tend to be solved super quick. I mean, it's, it's clean, it's easy, there's no negotiating or any of that nonsense, right? You just cut it off at the root. So, Many of us may look to Pincus and go like, that's what we need. That's the prescription. The problem is, this is not the prescription for every single situation. <laughs> I'll say it again. <laughs> the other thing about Pincus and like this vigilante justice thing is that He's not just like stabbing people. He's not like two hands spearing people, right? Not running through the camp like he's the star of the movie 300, just like 
just going after it, bludgeoning people. No, he kills these two people in this controlled and, and very precise way. It's like the difference between um, like shooting bead shot out of a shotgun, right? And just praying and spraying and a sniper, right? This is not like he's not just going through and just executing justice on everybody. It's these people. Now, were there other people sinning in that moment? And maybe even in a similar way, maybe so. But it was something about Zimri and this Midianite princess, actually, that, that focused Pincus's attention. I bet Zimri and them wish he would have been focused somewhere else. And obviously, he was pretty good with a spear. Because I don't, can't imagine what that would be like. So this, this idea that he's this vigilante is not. Now, on the other hand, for those of you zealots out there, let's have a conversation. This is not the solution for every issue. And you are not Phineas. Right? You know, we've talked about this Kedusha thing, right, with as you get closer in, in, in to your proximity to, to Hashem, you have more access, but you also have more responsibility. This is Pinchas' responsibility because of who he is. Anybody else that would have done this likely would have gotten charged with murder. Pinchas can because it's his responsibility, because of where he is, right? Where he is in the circles of Kedusha. Does that make sense? It is... And, and this is really important to understand. What is unlawful for some is righteous responsibility for others. What is unlawful for some is righteous responsibility for others. We see this all over the place. Here is one example. Another example is Korach. Another great example, right? Korach wanted to serve in the place of Moshe and Aaron, but he had a responsibility. It was illegal for him to transgress that level of Kedusha to, to serve the way that Moshe and Aaron's, Aaron did, but if Moshe and Aaron didn't do what they were called to do, that's their righteous responsibility. You understand what I'm saying? It's illegal for some, it's, it's responsibility for others. Now, just consider that spectrum when you're dealing with people in your own life. Is it, it, like, everybody you talk to about the truth, you don't have to go all pinkus on them, right? You don't have to go pinkus on grandma. She's served God for 60 years. She's doing the best she, leave her, leave her to it, you know what I mean? You don't have to go pink us on your in-laws or your family members or the person at work or whatever. Or you, you, that's not the solution. This is a very narrow issue. We derive this kind of zealot and like, oh, the truth, man, the truth. And, and look what God did for Pinkus. He gave him the covenant of peace. And, and, blah, blah, you know, and that's what God needs is, is people to stand for the truth no matter what. That's fine. If that's the way you want to do it, but you're going to end up really lonely and really isolated and everybody's going to go, stay away from that guy. And that might be what you want. If that's what you want, more power to you. But that's not the story. I think more of the story of the Torah is God coming to Moshe and go, hey, what's wrong with your people down there? They're acting like fools. And Moshe going yeah, I know, let's wipe them out. And God going, no, no, no. No, no, no. Let's have a talk. We're not going to do that. Or then Moshe coming to God and go, hey, look at these people. And God going, yeah, I know, right? I'm going to wipe them out. And Moshe going, whoa, whoa, maybe not. Let's sit down. Let's have some food. Let me make an offering, right? More of it is Elisha sitting under the tree was it Elisha or Elijah? Chased by Jezebel under the tree, despondent. 
I'm the only one. I'm the only one who's standing for truth. Nobody will listen to me. And what does God tell him? Like, hey, buddy, here's some food. Take a nap. When you wake up, it'll be all, all better. By the way, I have 3,000 more that you don't even know about. See, it's not all pinkus. A lot of getting truth to people and dealing with people is diplomacy. We don't like that, but that's the truth. So neither was this vigilante justice, nor is Pincus the precedent for us all to go just slay whoever doesn't want to hear our truth, right? It doesn't, doesn't work like that. We're standing for holiness, but we're not the arbiters of holiness as far as this goes, right? Okay, anyway, I'm getting way in over my head. So let's continue reading. Um, verse 14 says, the, slain, uh, the name of the slain Israelite man, <coughs> excuse me, um, who was slain with the Midianite army was Zimri, son of Salu, leader of the fa father's house of the Simeonites. So if you go forward a couple, we're not going to read the census today. You're welcome. But if you go forward another chapter and you read the census, you'll find there's five households of the Simeonites, right? Uh, five households of the Simeonites. Actually, you know what? Let's just read that part. Uh, okay, verse 12 of chapter 26. The sons of Simeon, according to their families, of uh, Nemuel, the Nemuelite family, of Yamin, the Yam Yamanite family, of Yakin, the Yakinite family, of Zerah, the Zerahite family, of Shaul, the Shaulite family. So you got five Simeonite families. So Zimri is a Nasi, a prince, a captain of one of those five families. Again, he's not just some average Israelite, right? He's not just some farmer that's been working hard and the sun's been beating him down. And he's just like, his crops are not growing. And he gets home and his wife and kids are hungry and he's just stressed. Nothing is working. And so what does he do? He goes over to the local Midianite par, bar, pub, to blow off some steam, and he meets a hot Midianite chick, and oops, right, has a moment of weakness. That's not who this guy is. Matter of fact, those guys and those women are never mentioned in this story. The one guy that is mentioned happens to be a prince of the Simeonite family. Simeonite family. He's a big deal. He carries a lot of weight, not only in the nation of Israel, but in other nations as well. Obviously, he scored a Midianite princess, right? Which is not is a big deal. So again, we're de not that God doesn't care about we lowly, normal believers do. Not that God doesn't care about that. He does. But the story of Scripture is constantly focused on righteous and unrighteous leaders. Now, you are a leader in your home, whether you're husband or wife. You are a leader maybe on your job. Wherever you are, you may be. But this is a story about us holding our leaders accountable. And so it says in verse 15, the name of the slain Midianite was Cosby, daughter of Zur, who was head of the peoples of a father's house in Midian. So same kind of, same kind of thing. Verse 16, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, harass the Midianites and smite them. For they harassed you through their conspiracy that they conspired against you in the matter of Peor. And in the matter of Cosby, daughter of leader of Midian, their sister who was slain on the day in the plague in the matter of Peor. So what we find out in a couple of chapters is this whole thing, the whole reason why Israel is in this predicament in the first place, all stems back to Balak, right? It's all connected to Parsha Balak, where he hires Balaam to do what? Curse Israel. And Balaam says, can't do it. Sorry. And we have the whole Balaam thing, epic with the donkey and the, and the treasure and all this stuff. Well, we find out in a few chapters that Balaam could not curse Israel so what did he do? He told the Midianites 
how to weaken Israel, and that was by seducing them with Midianite women. Now, some of you ladies may be sitting here thinking, why do we always get the short end of the stick? Why are we always made to sound like the, the sed seductresses and the, why do women always get such a, and if that's the way you're thinking about like how this is portrayed, it may be because it, it's a different culture. Let's just be honest. I don't want to try to protect the Bible from what it is. It was written in a male-dominated society. That's just the way it is. However, I honestly believe that the biblical uh, criticism and retort is actually on the part of the men in this story. Because it's, it's, it's not the Midianite women that God has a problem with. It's the Israelite men not being who they're supposed to be, especially the princes of them, right? It's a, it's a critique on the, the princes, the ones who have all the clout and power and say-so and responsibility. It's a critique on the men of Israel in this time that should have been the ones to go like, hey, hey, you farmers that are starting to run around with these Mennonite women, hey, you metal workers, hey, you whatever, tax collectors that are running around with these men, hey, hey, hey. No, we don't do that here. Cut it out. It should have been the princes that were doing that. Instead, what do they do? They take a princess from them and they walk through the camp and dare anybody to say anything differently. You see the, the upheaval? It's not the women that God is, is, is consternating here, ladies. It's not you. If anything, the Bible is consistently saying, hey, men... Freaking get it together, guys. Realize who you're supposed to be. Take control of your thoughts. Take control of your emotions. Take control of your bodies. And, and do righteousness. Not, not only for your own sake, but for the community around you. And so I hope, ladies, that you don't, you don't hear it like that. It's, uh, because I think that's the, the, the critique is misplaced if we hear it that way. So uh, let's kind of go through the rest of the partial. We have a second census. This is the second census of the book of Bamibar, right? Um, why is this a second census? Why are there two censuses? Because everybody died after the first one, right? Take the first one, golden calf, you know, waters of Marah, Meravah, and God goes like, no, you guys are despised. You guys are not, no, seen enough. So a new census because they're literally on the precipice of going into the land. Right? This is the end of the 40 years. This is like year 38, 39. They're on the precipice of going in. You take a census to know who's able to fight. Right? This is a military census of any, any male 20 to 50 is, is fighting age. Um, can you imagine some of you guys in here that are 40, 45, knocking on 50? Could you imagine being taken into the draft right now? It would be rough, wouldn't it? Maybe not for some of you. You zealots. For couch sitters like me, it'd be super rough. <laughs> Holy cow. Yikes. Um, so we have, the, we have the census. The numbers are interesting. But listen, please take my advice and don't get too worked up over the numbers, okay? There's, we talk about Eastern and Western thought and how Greeks and Hebrews think differently about things. Numbers is one of those areas that we think differently. And I know this is hard to get our head around. It doesn't make sense. But in some ways, I think we can relate. We think of numbers uh, qual uh, quantitatively. In other words, if you say two, you mean two. If you say two, you don't mean one, and you don't mean three. You mean two. If I'm working with Brother Ron, and he says, go get me, you know, two elbow, two PVC elbows, I'm going to come back with two, probably going to come back with three, just to be safe, but two definitely. Now, I'm not coming back with one. Numbers for us are qualitative, or quantitative, I'm sorry. For Eastern people, numbers are, are qual there's a quality to numbers, to a number. Um, we, we, we might be able to understand this a little bit, you know, like, what'd you catch today, dude? Like that long. Mm, like Maybe like this, but not like, you know. 
we have that understanding of kind of expressing, uh, exaggerating a little bit, right? But l- let me ask you the reason. What is the reason we exaggerate things? Why do we do that? To get a point across. What does that brother? Ego. Yeah, well, ego. Yeah, ego is good too. All right, we're going to talk about both of those. But, yeah, it makes the story better. Sometimes, it's, it, I think most of the time, it's because it's important to you. Whatever you're talking about is so important to you, you want to get that point across, right? It's, it's important for some, for whatever way, it's important that the story sticks, that the story lands, right? And so let's talk about getting the, the point across. What is the point of these number 600,000, right, Israelites? And the, what's, what's the point of that? Like, the point of this in my opinion, is that echoes of Genesis, right? Be fruitful and, right, and subdue the earth. They're fixing to go into a new land. They're passing through enemy territory, right? What, is, what are these 600,000 numbers a sign of that the, that the Eden blessing is with them? Also, Abraham, I'll make you more numerous, Matter of fact, last Parsha, who says that? Uh, oh, Balak says, they're more, they're covered the earth, right? They're more numerous than anything on the earth, right? <clears throat> he didn't have Google. He didn't know how many people on the earth. Did Balak really believe that they covered the earth? Or is it the Bible's way of, of reminding us, hinting to Abraham, going, hey, you remember? This is, Israel is enjoying the blessing of Abraham. And why do I bring this up? Probably not, not many of you in here, but there is a l- number, the book of Numbers gets a lot of criticism in Christianity, in Judaism, and all of it. It gets a lot of criticism from smart people on computers that can do research because all of the science we know about this area of the world at this time, this is like pre-Iron Age, beginnings of the Iron Age, All of the science we know, the archaeology, the history we know, tells us that factually, okay, factually documented proof that if if the Bible says Israel had 600 and some odd thousand men, there was, that population did not exist in this part of the world, period, in the whole region. There wasn't this many people. So there's a good chance that these numbers are not historical numbers, and they're not meant to be is what I'm telling you. It's Israel's way of telling a story. Now, Brother Ron said ego, and I love that answer. Because many believe that this is like Moses is actually writing this down as it happens, okay? And that's one option. Another option is that the book of Numbers was um, edited together, was, was codified from different scrolls later by priests and scribes. And it was taking, taking some of Israel's history and putting it together in a way that would make, make it understandable. We're talking about like maybe, maybe pre-Babylonian time frame or maybe even a little bit before that. And Israel is trying to make Israel look good. The priests of Israel, the the scribes of Israel are taking all these oral accounts of their history and they're taking what little bit they might have written and they're putting it together and they're going like, no, like you tell your own story, you're going to make it look good. That's just the way we, that's the way we roll, right? Because we all have a little bit of ego, but it speaks to who God is and his testimony and, and, and the whole thing. So all that to say, don't get caught up on the numbers. Because the numbers are important, but we don't, we're not really equipped well at reading this this way, reading these numbers this way. If it really is interesting to you, I'll give you some resources that you can go and, and study, but they're tough, and they're going to hurt your feelings, and I'll kind of just leave it at that. Okay, so we have the, um, the census, and then we have the census of the Levites, um, and we have the Gershonites, the Kohathites, and the... Uh, Merarites, of course, that were the three families that had different responsibilities in moving the tabernacle and preparing the vestments and all those those kinds of things. Um, and 
we find out in verse 61, this is chapter 26, uh, Nabab and Adihu died when they brought an alien fire, so it's just kind of recounting these things. Um, and we find out there's 23,000 according to these numbers. Uh, let's see. Okay, and then verse 65 of chapter 26. Um, I'm sorry, 64. And of these, there was no man of those counted by Moshe and Aaron the Kohen who counted the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. That's the first census. For Hashem said of them, they will surely die in the wilderness, and not a man of them was left except for Caleb, son of Yephuneh, and Yehoshua, son of Nun. And then we have this beautiful story about the daughters of Zelophehad. I love this story. Again, this is one of those areas where we can really see the Torah struggling with this idea of even uh, sexuality and sexism, even a little bit in, in, the, in the Torah. Um, and, and I love this story because, and, and the last story about the Midianite women because it highlights in a way our, bringing our modern culture and our modern issues to the biblical text, right? I don't think an ancient, is, uh, an ancient Israelite, let's say a Babylonian Israelite, Babylonian time frame, would read this story and go, gosh, why is the Torah so sexist? Oh. I don't think that's what they would get out of it at all. Because that's not the issues they're dealing with, right? That's not the big scary monster in the room. They've been exiled. Their houses have been destroyed. Our people are living in them that are not supposed to be living in them, right? They've lost family members. They've, they're dealing with other issues besides, not that sexism isn't an issue, but they're dealing with other issues. When we see things like racism, sexism, sometimes that's us, that's a clear sign that we're bringing our modern context to the story, to the text. Because there is, there are stories like this. I love this. The daughters of Zelophehad, um, son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of uh, Manasseh. So if you want to do this genealogy, there it is. Go in the census and check it out. Um, uh, the sons of Manasseh and the son of Joseph, they drew near. There's that word that we love so much. And these are the names of his daughters. Uh, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirzah. Notice they all end with Yah. So they all have really cool meanings. Uh, and they stood before Moshe, before Eleazar the Kohen, um, and before the leaders of the entire assembly at the entrance to the tent of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, but he was not among the assembly that was gathered against Hashem in the assembly of Korah. But he died of his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be omitted from among the family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. And Moshe brought their claim before Hashem. And, Mo and Hashem said to Moshe, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad had speak properly. You shall surely give them possession of inheritance among the brothers of their father, and, uh, and shall cause inheritance of their father to pass over to them. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, If a man die and has no son... You shall cause his inheritance to pass over to his daughter. If he has no daughter, you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, you should give it to his, the brothers of his father. If there are no brothers of his father, and it goes, and the, the, the ends is saying that this shall be for the children of Israel to create justice, for Hashem commanded Moshe. So <clears throat> this may not seem like a big deal. It's a beautiful story, and it has to deal with the most important uh, inheritance in the land of Israel, and I would, I would argue period. The most important inheritance beside a spiritual inheritance is one of land, is one of property. Now, I don't know if the Boyds are watching, but, you know, we have our, we have our gypsy, you know, friends and family that, like, it's cool, you know, travel and, and, and whatever. I, I was raised that land, home, those things are are what you work for. That's what you spend your, your blood, sweat, and tears for. That's what you do because it gives your family and your children a, a sense of security and belonging, right? Now, that may be an old way of thinking. I don't know, but I like it, and I agree with it. It's the way I was raised. And this idea that, that land, you know, my dad always used to say, buy all the land you can because they're not making any more of it, right? And so this idea of land as an inheritance is important, I think, for anybody, but especially in the land of Israel, because there's not much of it to go around. And secondly, who is this land given by? Not by Moses, yeah, it's given by Hashem. 
So like if, you're, if your mom and dad leave you a piece of land, that's special and beautiful and wonderful and, and it should be treated as such. But if a shim gives you land, and how did they determine which tribe got which pieces of land? Does anybody know? By lots, right. They roll the dice. <laughs> not, not actually, go in a bag and figure out. By lots. And we're like, that's gambling. Yeah, I know, it's in the Bible. It is what it is. But they understood that whatever lot they pulled, that was the hand of Hashem. That's what, that was the one that Hashem wanted them to have. So it's land given by Hashem. And what this story is, is t- talking to us about is that these daughters understand this concept. They understand this, this visceral connection to the land as children of Manasseh. And they, they not only want the land because it's their right, but they want the land for what it means. It means their place in the congregation of Israel. It means their father's name and his standing and his, 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 uh, his memory, his zakar, his memory at, at being in the congregation of Israel. It means that they have the chance now to have sons who will have, and, and daughters who will have a place now in the land. It's their inheritance. It's their tie and their portion to the land. And so it is very important and very, very, very beautiful. And then we can't finish this uh, reading about Moshe in verse 12, chapter 27. Uh, Hashem said to Moses, go up on the mountain of Avarim and see the land that I've given to the children of Israel. You shall see it and shall be gathered unto your people. You too, as Aaron, your brother, was gathered in. Because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of Zin, in the uh, assembly strife to sanctify me at the water before their eyes, there were the waters of strife at Kadesh, the waters, uh, the wilderness of Zim. So Moshe spoke to Hashem, saying, May Hashem, God of all spirits, all flesh, appoint a man over the assembly who shall go before them and come before them, before who they shall take him in, unless the assembly of Hashem, of Hashem be like sheep that have no shepherd. So Hashem said to Moses, take yourself Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom there is spirit and upon him, and you shall stand him before Eleazar the Kohen and before the entire assembly and command him before their eyes. And you shall place some of your majesty upon him so that the entire assembly of the children of Israel will pay heed. Before Eleazar the Kohen shall he stand who shall inquire for him the judgment of the Urim. Uh, remember, that's what the high priest wears before Hashem. Uh, at his word, they shall go out, and his word, they shall come in. He and all the children of Israel with him and the entire assembly. And Moshe did as Hashem commanded him and took Joshua and stood him before Eleazar the Kohen and before the entire assembly. And he leaned his hands on him and commanded him as Hashem had spoken through Moses. So God says, you're going to see it, but you're not going to go in. And when we go to Israel, by the way, we're going to really start talking about, Hanuk's going to talk about this next week. Um, we are, are shooting to go to Israel in 2023 is what our, our plan is. What's that? Oh, sorry. Um, as, as much of a group as we can. I, and, and so you have a year and four months, almost a year and a half to start, to start saving. Um, and it will probably take you that long. But Hanuk will talk more about that later. But here's why I want you to go to Israel with me. Why I want you to come with us. Because I want you to stand on this hilltop called Elan Moray, in this place called Elan Moray. And I want you to look over at these two mountains. One is Har Bracha, the Mount of Blessing, and one is the Mount of Curses. And between those two mountains is where the nation of Israel walked into the land of Israel where the Levites stood one on each side, remember, and pronounced blessings and cursings. I want you to stand on Elam Moray, and I want you to look at those two mountains and look at where the nation came in to finally possess the land. It, it'll, it'll wreck you first, and it'll change your life. Moses is on the other side of those mountains in this story, in Transjordan, east of the Jordan. And I, I believe, that I don't have anything to prove, it's just my conviction, that God is showing him these two mountains, and in between them you can see the plains of, of Israel. And I believe God, that's what God's showing him, and saying, you can see it. 
what I love about this, and then we go on the rest of the Parsha to talk about the offerings, Rosh Kodesh, Pesach. It's a kind of a, a recapitulation of everything we've heard before, so we won't take all the time to read it all. Um, and the, the portion ends with Moshe faithfully saying everything that Hashem had said to him. But this, what I love about Moshe, we, I think we read about it in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, that Moshe doesn't get to go into the land, but there's some sense that Moshe is buried, that Moshe is buried there somewhere, right? Right on the east side of the Jordan. And while nobody really knows where Moshe is buried, we do know that some of Israel stayed on that side, right? Half tribe of Manasseh, right? And so I, I saw this years ago, and I don't know if it can be proven. This is just my way of thinking about it, and I like it, so don't take it from me. <laughs> the, this idea that Moshe didn't go into the land, but because part of the the nation decided to stay on the east side of the Jordan where he's buried. He's still buried with his people. He's still a part of the nation. It would have been something different if Moses would have been buried there and everybody went across. It would have been like, wow, that's really sad. It's sad enough he didn't get to go in. But to be left for who, who knows whoever to find him, his, his remains, his, his grave, and the whole nation just to move on without him, but with, with Manasseh and those tribes staying on the east, I should be doing it like this for you, on the east side and the Jordan and everyone going in and filling the land, it's still tying Moses into the land. He's still a part of the whole nation. He's still a part of the whole congregation. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. There's still a, there's still a tie back to Moses, um, even in the new taking of the land. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So... Um, Great Parsha, full of stuff. These, these ones and numbers are, are absolutely chock-a-block full of things. Um, so I pray you, you get some chance to study and read uh, next week's Parsha beforehand. And um, we say this blessing at the end. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who gave us a Torah of truth and implanted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Hashem, giver of the Torah. Amen. So thank you guys.